I am standing on top of a drone flying over Centennial Campus to welcome you. But if you're in Raleigh, you know it's raining, so you know that I'm lying. So uh, as I said, we're just going to wait uh, one more minute. We'll get started right at 101. We're very excited to have you with us today. Okay, so it's one after one, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Jacob Jones. I'm a professor of material science and engineering and director of the analytical instrumentation facility. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you today to an experiment. This is our first ever virtual open house. So we're literally going to bring you through the cameras into the laboratories to see the staff, the exciting staff, and the exciting equipment and some exciting results. So they uh, have prepared um, a lot for this. They're excited to welcome you and greet you in this time of social distancing. So thanks for being here. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Shadow Huang, um, a professor of uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering and a recent recipient of a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. She's the Associate Director of the AIF and she's gonna be your Scientific Master of Ceremonies today. So Shadow, I'm gonna turn this over to you and uh, just say again, welcome everyone and we are so glad to see you. Thank you, Jacob, and welcome. And so uh, thank you for taking your time and to uh, uh, listen to us about what we should, uh, what we will present to you. So welcome to AIF, um, the office, uh, um, the office, no, I'm sorry, the open house for that. So before I start it, let me introduce a little bit about what AIF is for. Okay, so let me try that again. So AIF is one of the six core cool facilities at NC State. As you can see that uh, at NC State, we, uh, we aim to provide any, any, uh, any type of help to, for you to do the research uh, from the material to characterization to the all the way to the high performance computing. So the mission of the AIF is to enable and lead state-of-the-art research through acquisition, development, maintenance, training, and access to major analytical and material characterization instrumentation. Do you mind go to the next slide? Yes, so uh, we have a strong team. Uh, we have uh, two tenure professors uh, to manage the AIF, and we have uh, Dr. Gao, he is the assistant professor in material science. He is our TEM principal scientist. And we have Mao, she is the RTNN associate director, and RTNN is part, uh, AIF is part of the RTNN. So we have two business staffs one is for the financial, and another is for any type of the paperwork you might need help, which is Anna. Uh, uh, can you go to the next slide? And for our staff, or we have all kinds of the uh, material characterization equipment um, from the X-ray diffraction, uh, nano indentation, X-ray computed tomography, and biological preparations. So in later um, the open house that uh, we will show you some of the equipments. Please go to the next slide. And we also have a uh, service analysis, uh, SEM and TEM. So all those lab managers will spend 10 minutes and to talk to you about their expertise. And then you can discuss with them after the open, hour, uh, after the open house, uh, we will have a Q&A for you to discuss and to better prepare your sample and then maybe to help you better for your research. You can go to the next slide. And so not only we help you to uh, uh, work, uh, work with you for your research, we also have uh, workshops, short courses, and to train, train you or maybe expand your knowledge from that. And we constantly give you tools for visitors, industry researchers, and classrooms. Next slide. Okay, so here um, I just briefly show you that we have more than 30 major pieces of instrumentation, including sample preparations. So uh, you can see the lo lower left side of the pie chart. So there are some um, uh, SEM, TEM, FIB, all those things. And you can see that the, uh, this is the distribution that the, how much uh, users have spent time on our equipment. 
And we also serve a lot of uh, uh, different uh, researchers in the campus. Now, not only in College of Engineering, even though it's 82%, but we also have, uh, we also serve a lot of uh, uh, service to different colleges, including uh, CALS or Nanwuven Institute and also uh, vet schools. Uh, we also welcome that uh, external uh, government or in industry use our equipment. So, so far in the last, uh, in the past fiscal year, we have a 99 unique external government. So please contact us if you are interested uh, then to know a little bit more about our equipment or to be involved uh, and to see how we can better help you. Uh, next slide. So here you see that um, for the past fiscal year, we have 16,000 hours in our in, uh, instrument. And for each instrument that, that we help a lot. And then so uh, when people publish the papers that they will acknowledge us. For example, last uh, calendar year, we have 150 publications. If you can see the chart and you, and you will see that the, we have a lot of, uh, uh, pub, uh, we have increased the publications that uh, acknowledge AIF. So, so far you see that at the, uh, at the right hand side, you see that um, we, every month we have user spotlights. So we literally feature your research in our newsletters. So if you are interested in uh, being featured and talk about more about your research and let people know or maybe seek out collaborations, please contact us and then we will feature you in our newsletter. Next slide. This is the brief view about our newsletter. Uh, so from June, July to August. So we have a topics about uh, Spotlight and also maybe you have a new equipment and maybe you have a workshop and we will always um, um, broadcast in this newsletter. And also that the newsletter right now we have already, already reached more than 3,500 individuals. So in the next slide, please. Here you see that we also have a, we just released a, a YouTube channel, uh, maybe like two months ago. So we have 70 subscribers. So if you are interested, please go ahead to uh, subscribe our YouTube and then or send us emails, let us know if you want to be involved or subscribe our newsletter. So please make sure that you go to our YouTube channel. You can see that uh, this is a lot of uh, tutorials how to use uh, uh, one of our in, uh, instrument and later on the lab managers will show you or maybe will have some quick you know go through about how the instrument is working so all the newsletter and the youtube channels are actually um managed by anna so anna is going to take over to talk about her uh, responsibility and how she create those youtube channels and uh, newsletters anna Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Shadow, for the introduction. So uh, I'm Anna Lumpkin. I'm the University Program Specialist. I've been with AIF uh, for four years now, and I am responsible for most of our online content. So we have a lab management software that we use uh, to book appointments on our instruments. Um, I'll, I'll give you a brief demonstration later of what it looks like. Uh, but I helped manage that. I helped uh, to create it with a few other offices on campus. Um, I also upload all of our YouTube content and uh, I, I send out all of our newsletters. Um, so I'm actually pursuing a master's degree in college counseling right now, uh, but I'll be with AIF um, for, for a long time. I've, I really love it here. Um, so that's pictured my husband and my son, uh, Scott and Liam. We like to go outside, explore, go kayaking, that sort of thing. So just a little bit about myself. Um, and if you have any questions, my email address is listed at the very bottom there, uh, but Maude can also drop that in the chat. So, uh, or you can find it on the website if, if you need to. Um, so I'll pass it on now to Tanzania, uh, who is our business officer. Hi, my name is Tanzania Ray, and I'm the business officer for the analytical instrumentation facility. As the business officer, I facilitate the agreement process for all of our external customers. This includes any startup agreements, such as order forms and lab use agreements, as well as modifications. I also ensure that these customer agreements are reflected in our Mendex system. As the business officer, I also take care of the accounts receivables for the facility. Another aspect of my role is to manage the rates being charged to all of our facility users, ensuring that they are fair and meet industry standards. 
If you are looking to become an external user of our facility, please feel free to reach out to me directly to help you get started. Thank you. So now, finally, we're going to the technical part. So the first, I want to introduce Roberto Garcia. He's our operations manager. He is also uh, our feed lab manager. So I think that the, our slide just go through a little bit. Okay, so here. I am so, Hi. <laughs> so um, let me uh, introduce Roberto a little bit. He has a bachelor and master degrees in material science at RPI from Upper State New York. He was an electron microscopy lab manager at Bright State University, and he joined us in 1998. He's a member of ASM, and he's also an organizer of the local MRS ASM AVS meeting. So Roberto, please take it away. Okay, hey everyone, I'm coming to you live from the FIB lab. Um, behind me, you can see the FIB and uh, what that is, if you're not um, familiar with it, uh, FIB is focused ion beam. So if you look at it, it looks a lot like a scanning electron microscope. And this instrument is actually a dual beam system. So it actually has a scanning electron microscope column on it, which is this tall column up back here. And then uh, let's go back to the slides. And we also have an ion beam uh, column that's attached to it. Okay. There we go. So here we have the uh, SEM column, scanning electron microscope column, so that we can use that to uh, find a area of interest on our sample. Uh, on the side here at 52 degrees, we have this ion beam column. And what that does is it allows us to take these uh, gallium ions and accelerate them towards the sample. And what that'll do is it'll remove material from the surface. Uh, we also have here this uh, gas injection needle. And what that lets us do is insert a gas into the um, chamber at the same time that we use the ion beam. And what that uh, lets us do is to actually deposit material. In this case, we have a platinum deposition needle, so we can actually deposit platinum in certain uh, areas. This other big, large black thing here is a uh, uh, micro manipulator, and we use that to actually do some uh, removal of materials to make TEM samples. All right. Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is. Um, 90% of the time, this uh, instrument is being used to make uh, TEM samples. So what we see here is we see the, um, an, it, we find an area of interest. Uh, we have this gas injection needle to deposit platinum. We also have the uh, micro manipulator needle here. And what we do is we remove material from either side of an area of interest to create this very thin window here that we then attach to the needle and then bring it over and attach it to a uh, copper grid that will then go into the TEM. And once it's on that copper grid, uh, we can then further thin that down. Once, it, once it's on the grid, it's probably two microns to about um, maybe 1.5 microns. While it's on the grid, we'll further thin it down to about 100 nanometers or less. And then that allows the uh, TEM, uh, the electron beam from the TEM to actually penetrate through it. You can see it here. Okay. One of the other unique uh, characteristics of this uh, instrument is uh, ion channeling. So if we have a polycrystalline material and we use the ion beam to generate second to generate electrons when the ion beam when the ions hit it, it actually has this channeling contrast, and that gives us a very quick view of the grain structure. Uh, you can also see some defects. In this case, this is copper. And what you're seeing is some twinning in the grains. So it's a very quick way to get a feel for the grain size or if there's any um, kind of uh, materials defects in your, in your sample. Again, same thing here. We can see uh, the grain structure from the base material down here all the way to the top. So this was a sample that was laser, um, laser treated at the top. So you can see a very fine grain structure down here and then it actually gets a little bit coarser and then finally it gets this elongated kind of uh, structure here. One of the other things and probably the uh, next major thing that uh, the instruments used for is for patterning. So uh, what we can do and what some people are doing here in this top um, uh, left corner here is they're patterning, taking this very nanoscale pattern 
and putting it to diamond. What they can then do is take that pattern and press it into other materials. So like a ceramic or a glass uh, to transfer that pattern over. Now Tuffy here that's in the center, he's in a piece of silicon. And all that is is just basically a uh, bitmap image, uh, a grayscale image uh, where wherever the pixel is bright, it's going to dwell the beam for a very long time. And where it's darker, it's going to be less. So all that does is uh, basically create this kind of 3D kind of relief on here. Um, we have over here on the upper right, a hair from one of the librarians. And uh, we've uh, actually etched the NC State Library logo into that. And there's two scales here. The smallest one is gonna be about 10 microns in width, okay? We did a similar thing. Uh, we did this little logo for the College of Textiles in the lower right-hand corner here. Uh, the other thing we can use for patterning in this case here is uh, this is actually a cement and cement has very different phases in it. So after this cement is uh, set, they want to check the mechanical properties at a particular phase. So in this case, we created a tiny little pillar uh, that's just in that phase. And then we'll take an AFM tip and kind of squash it. And that'll give us information about that phase after the cement has uh, set. And I think that's it. And now let me uh, introduce another lab manager, uh, Fred. Fred is our service science lab manager. He's also our safety officer. Fred has been with AIA for 18 years and was on the technical staff of Bell Labs for 29 years before joining us. He is an ABS fellow and has produced three books and over 200 publications on analytical topics, principally on scenes and themes. He is involved with XPS, scenes, and Raymond technique. He also likes to talk jokes. Fred, I'm going to turn the floor to you. Okay, so welcome to Studio AIF. And uh, in the background, you'll see our X-ray foot electron spectrometer. Uh, it's a nice toy. I call it an adult toy. It has a lot of stainless steel there, which is a vacuum system. So let's go to the slide so I can explain what this does. Okay, good. So we're looking at the electrons that come off when we bombard this sample with X-rays. The previous technique, the FIB used ions in, and you looked at the atoms that came off to remove material and the electrons to actually see what's going on. Why would we want to do X-rays into the material and look at the electrons? The analysis step and the chemical information are the key parts of this. It's a very surface sensitive technique. If you look at that analysis step shown, it's 0.3 to 10 nanometers. It's really the very surface. We can detect elements down to well, mostly around a tenth of a percent, and everything except hydrogen and helium. We can also quantify. But another key part of this is we can get chemical information from this technique. And for this, Kai Siegmann was awarded the Nobel Prize. If we can go to the next slide. Can we go to the next slide? All right, the next slide shows a filament. We're passing a current through it and generating, uh, okay. Can we go back one slide? So I'm trying to adjust it here, but it's uh, not cooperating. Well, let's get that slide. We'll stick with this one. So the previous slide, what we're, there we go. We're bombarding the sample with electrons of the uh, anode with electrons that come off from the filament. That generates x-rays which penetrates several micrometers into the material. As that material is bombarded with these x-rays, we get electrons to come off. Some of them come off without collisions with the material. Those are XPS electrons. The other ones are your background, which are uh, due to having lost some energy. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And if you look at this spectrum, the peaks that are labeled are your XPS peaks. Those background steps that you see 
are due to the background from electrons that lost energy coming out of the material. And from this, we can take this survey spectrum here, we can actually provide quantitative information about this material. All right, we can go to the next slide. And the figure on the left shows a survey spectrum showing carbon, oxygen, oxygen for polyethylene terephthalate, PET. But I was mentioning before we could get chemical information, and this really makes the technique valuable. So if you look at the portion of the figure on the right, you will see that we have different bonds, carbon-carbon, carbon-oxygen, carbon double bond, single bond to oxygen, uh, uh, carbon double bond, single bond to oxygen. Those reflect those specific bonds in PET. The area under the curve gives you the percentage of those bonds. So we get real chemical information from this analysis. And if we can go to the next slide. So here's our instrument. You can see that we have a number of features on it, different sources, uh, the detectors, which allow us to pick up the electrons that are going through the analyzer, which is that big half dome on the top of the uh, uh, instrument. We can also sputter the material with argon to remove contamination. We have an electron flood gun for charge neutralization, and we have a great vacuum, and that enables us to not uh, be depositing material on the sample when we're doing analysis. So I think that uh, may be the last slide and I think we're about, to, oh, there's one more, go ahead. So this is very surface sensitive and for people that submit samples for XPS, you really don't want to touch the area at all. We don't want to store the samples in plastic bags. We want to use materials such as fluoroware containers, glass or aluminum foil. This will also be true for a number of other techniques, particularly on the flight sims, which Elaine Zoe will be talking about shortly. So I know you're going to learn a number of things from our open house. I'll leave you with one you probably hadn't thought about, and that's the definition of decaffeinated. And that, of course, is what you call a cow that has just given birth. So now I'll turn over to Elaine. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. So if you are interested the, uh, in submitting the sample to AIF, uh, please go to our website that uh, we have a very clear uh, um, you know, instructions, how are you going to send up the samples? And then you can uh, let us know uh, what kind of the data analysis you would like to have. So please go to our website. So now let me introduce Elaine. Elaine uh, Elan Joe is our R&D manager and uh, in the surface science lab. Elaine has a PhD, uh, master, bachelor degrees from Jilin University, master degrees from National University in Singapore of Singapore, and PhD in surface science from Washington University in St. Louis. She is a member of ACS, AAS, and Sigma Psi, and she is also a reviewer for, for many many internationally circulated journals. Elaine, please take it away. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Shadow. Um, so this is Elaine and I'm broadcasting um, from my office at MRC 318. Um, Anna, could you please put it back to the, um, to the slides? All right. Um, okay. All right. So. Before um, I touch on the technical stuff, I'd like to take this moment to introduce a little bit more about myself, like personal thing. So I was born in Jilin city, Jilin um, province in China. Um, if you look at the China map, it looks like a lot of people say it looks like a chicken. And where Jilin city is located is in the chicken head position. And it is very, it's kind of similar position like New York or Boston. So you can imagine it's very, very cold in the winter. As for my age, of course, this is uh, gonna be a top secret. I'm not gonna tell you that. 
Um, I am married and I have two really cute daughters. They are 10 years old and nine years old as of today. Uh, at my free time, um, I really like to do a lot of sports. Uh, most of the time I'm gonna, uh, I am doing uh, playing badminton and occasionally doing some uh, volleyball and hiking. And at home, I like to read and spend uh, a lot of time with my families. All right, I think that's enough for um, introducing myself. And now let's go back to the technical stuff. Uh, well, so today, uh, what I'm gonna touch on basically are two uh, chemical analysis technique. So the first one is a time of flight, secondary IMS spectrometry, pop -sins. It is a very, very surface sensitive analytical tool and which involves ions in and then ions out. So in a typical topsin setup, your uh, sample surface um, typically is a, a solid. It's bombarded with a pulsed primer ion beam and normally is bismuth. Uh, with interaction of the ions and the sample, a lot of secondary species coming out from the materials and they include electrons, and neutrons, and ions. And, and over here, only the ions that can be extracted by the extractor, and then their master charge ratio will be uh, measured by their flight time. So how, this, how does this work? Because um, all the ions are essentially has the same initial kinetic energy, and they all traveled at almost the same length to reach the detector. Um, so that the mass to charge ratio is actually proportional to the time of flight. So the lighter the ions, the shorter the time they will fly to reach the detector. And that's how we can separate different species from the surfaces. <clears throat> so what type of data we can get from time of flight sense? Um, the essential, the first thing is the mass spectrum from the surface that gives you the detailed information about the molecular structure of the materials. Besides the mass spectrum, we can also get a reactive mass spectra imaging, which gives you the spatial distribution of different species, including um, elemental and molecular materials. With the dual beam setup in this instrument, um, for example, the cesium can be used to spot the materials with this setting, we can also get a depth profile of elements, or um, if we use C60, we can also get the molecular ions, which as a function of depth. So that is very useful for a lot of inorganic multilayer materials or thin films. All right, so now that's, um, so see, uh, because of the time limit, I'm gonna only give you one example of using top sims to do, uh, to kind of doing some daily work. Um, and this project is actually involved in a campus uh, forensic analysis. And what, re what we really want to look at is um, which came first, whether the ink or the pencil. Um, the reason we do this is one of the professor from NC State uh, would like to um, ask us to confirm whether the students is cheated or not. Um, so we look at the, um, all these things under optical image um, with pencil first and ink first. You really couldn't tell the difference between these two optical image because all looks like ink first, the pencil on top. But uh, time of flight seems actually got, um, is a very surface sensitive technique and you only look at the information depth is about 10 to 20 Armstrong from the top layer of the surface. So anything was covered underneath cannot be detected. If we can find the ions that are specific to ink, then we can map the ink distribution. And so here is what we got. So if pencil first, ink on top, we can see a whole stripe of the ink mark. If ink first, pencil on top, this is what we got. We only see ink in this open area that <clears throat> the area was covered by pencil could not be uh, observed. 
So the, the student uh, cheated or not. Uh, eventually, we uh, cut a few pieces from the final paper. And then um, we took uh, top sense images. And all the results shows that the pencil first and ink on the top, which means the students is not cheating. And the professor is pretty happy that he didn't say anything um, before he has any proof to, uh, to the student. So maybe the TA had a wrong grade for the student. Anyway, all right. So another uh, chemical analysis technique I'd like to share with you is called Raman spectrography. Um, and um, Raman spectrography is a simply light scattering technique. Um, and it involves a photon of light inter interaction with the sample, and then you produce the scattered uh, radiation of different wavelengths. So the Raman shift we record is actually the difference between <clears throat> the incident laser, the photon, and the emitted wavelength. And the value of the peak that depends uh, on the chemical bondings. Um, as you can see over here, this is the instrument we have at AIF. It, um, the instrument is from Horiba. Um, and um, like I showed two examples over here. So the first one is how we can use Raman spectrography to look at the fingerprints of different chemicals. And if you look at um, the chemical of ethanol and methanol, they are actually really similar, but their Raman, spectro uh, Raman spectrum shows a lot of difference. Um, and this with the confocal feature and also the automated uh, XY stage, we can also use um, uh, Raman to do a reactive map to show the different distribution of uh, the distribution of different chemicals. And this is just a Raman map of pharmaceutical tablets showing the active integrates of each um, of, the, of the tablets. Um, I think uh, that's what, uh, what I would like to share today. I'm going to turn um, the speaker to a shadow to introduce our um, XRD lab manager. Thank you, Elen. So, um, so let me introduce Dr. Zhong. Um, BB, he is our XRD lab manager. And Dr. Zhong is, uh, he has a bachelor degrees and master degrees from National Chenggong University in Taiwan. And he has PhD in material science engineering from University of Connecticut. And then the, the, all his degrees are in material science. And you can see BB standing in front of the, the major equipment at AIF. So BB's work involves phase identification, uh, texture study, phase transition behavior, and reaction study of solid material using X-ray diffraction-based techniques. BB, so can you show us a little bit about uh, your XRD? Sure. Thank you, Shadow, for your introduction. Hey, everyone. My name is BB, Qin Zhang Zhong. I'm the XRD lab manager at AIF. In the next few minutes, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of our XRD lab and talk about the capabilities of 50 photometers we have at AIF. So first of all, let's talk about what information you can get from the XRD measurement. X-ray diffraction is a very powerful technique. It provides information on crystal structure, phase compositions, and sample texture, and other structural parameters, such as, uh, such as crystallinity, crystallized size, and strain, and even defect concentration of the materials. And currently, we have two X-ray diffractometers at AIF. One is Rigaku Smart Lab, and the other one is Panalytical Empyrean. So let me open up the door of the Panalytical Empyrean so you can have a better look at this instrument. All right. So on the left hand side of this instrument, we have an X -ray, a copper X-ray tube. This is our X-ray source of this system. On the other end of this instrument, we have an X-ray linear detector. And this detector allows us to do a very quick data collection. And during the XRD measurements, your sample will be sitting at the center of this instrument. 
And what you are looking at right now is a room temperature sample stage we have for this system. And besides, besides this sample stage, we also have four non-ambient sample stages. Let me bring it closer so you can see better. We also have those non-ambient sample stages that you can install on the system. And those non-ambient sample stages allow us to do the XRD measurements in a very, very wide temperature range. We can do the measurements from a liquid nitrogen temperature all the way up to 2300 Celsius. And some of you might have already noticed we have a lot of gas cylinders sitting right beside the instrument. And yes, that's correct. We can do the measurements at different atmospheres. So we can do in the measurements in air, inner gas, reactive gas, and in vacuum. So let's go back to the PowerPoint slides. All right, so next page. Another interferometer we have is a uh, Rigaku Smart Lab, and we have multiple optics that you can choose on the Rigaku Smart Lab. For example, you can install a germanium 220 double bond smartometer for high resolution XRD measurements, or you can install the parallel beam setup on the system, and that allows you to do the grazing angle XRD or X ray refractivity measurements. And one more thing I would like to add to the Rigaku Smart Lab is this system is super user friendly. Typically, you can become an independent user just right after two training sessions. So in the following slides, I would like to give you some examples or show you some examples that we collected using these two systems. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So the first example is the powder XRD pattern of Syria. And we collecting this pattern on the Imperium within just 15 minutes. So within 15 minutes, you can see a very nice and clear XRD pattern. And right up, the first, first thing after we collecting this data, we do a phase identification on this system, on this pattern. Basically, we compare the XRD pattern with the reference we found on the XRD database, just trying to make sure that the sample we scan is indeed the Syria. And after that, we perform a reveal refinement analysis on this sample and to having a very accurate lattice parameters. So next slide. The next example I'm going to show you is in-situ crystallization and reaction study on the perovskite system. And this perovskite system is a sodium bismuth barium titanate. In this experiment, we mix like different uh, precursors at room temperatures. And after that, we put the mixed powder into one of our non-ambient sample stages and slowly heat it from room temperature all the way up to a thousand degrees Celsius. And in this 3D XRD pattern, you can see that there were not much going on below uh, at the temperature below 300 Celsius. And around 320 Celsius, the one of the precursor started to decompose and react to the other uh, precursors. And the final product of sodium bismuth barium tinnet starts to form in around 600 Celsius. However, there were still like um, other precursors still remaining in the system until 800 Celsius. So based on this result, we know that if you want to synthesize a sodium bismuth barium tinnet system, you will need to heat treat it at least 800 Celsius. And this is a very good example to show you that in-situ XRD measurements can help you to optimize your processing conditions. <clears throat> so next slide. Not only the reaction studies, in-situ XRD measurement can be used for study, uh, studying the phase transitions, crystallizations, lattice expansions, and the reduction and oxidation reactions in the materials. 
So you can do a lot of very cool things using the in-situ XRD uh, and you can uh, have a better understanding of the behaviors of this material under non-ambient conditions. So the next slide will be my last examples. And this example is a unique capability we have at AIF that is performing the XRD measurements under the applications of electric fields. In this, in this example, we apply a triangular bipolar electric field onto a ferroelectric electric less net type net material. And basically, you, on this pattern, you can see a 002 and 200 peaks of this less net type net. The intensity of these two peaks has some interchanges with electric fields. And those, uh, the interchange in the peak intensity is actually associated with the ferroelectric domain wall motion inside this material. And based on this result, we can actually quantify the degree of domain reorientations inside this PZT or less connect type net. And I hope you enjoy this short introduction of the XRD lab. If you have any questions, please leave your questions in the Q&A box. And I'll turn the floor back to Shadow. Oh, Bibi, we did have a question if you want to just answer it really quickly live. Sure. Um, uh, there's a attendee that wants to have a little elaboration about the difference in information obtained by grazing angle XRD. OK, so that is very quick questions. So if you are working with the thin films, which uh, usually you have the film thickness around 100 nanometer or below 100 nanometer. So if you are performing the typical X-ray uh, diffraction measurements or fragment tunnel setup, a lot of time you are finding your, the X-ray diffraction signal is very weak for those films. So in that situation, we are going to perform in a, a technique called grazing angle XRD measurements. And during the XRD, uh, GI XRD measurements, we put the X-ray source at a very shallow angle. So to increase the pathway of the X-ray inside a film, and that can enhance the diffraction signal uh, of the measurement during the measurements. So the GI XRD measurement is typically used for the, uh, in the sim film samples. I hope that answers the questions. So right now, let me uh, introduce our TEN lab manager. So uh, in TEN lab, we have uh, three members. So Chris is our lab manager. Chris has a bachelor degree from Rice University and PhD from Drexel, all in material science and engineering. Chris has almost 20 years of experience in the field of material characterization using EM techniques and has experience with preparing and imaging a wide range of material systems. So uh, Chris, do you mind uh, introducing uh, Toby and Aubrey later? And or maybe I can uh, you know, jump in, but let me uh, turn the floor to uh, Chris right now. Hi everyone, welcome to the open house. And you know, we're here to talk about TEM, which stands for Transmission Electron Microscopy. You know, TEM is a complicated topic. So I figure the next three, four hours, we'll, we'll spend some time to, what's that, what's that? No, oh, sorry, for the next few minutes. Okay, okay. So Anna, if you don't mind going to the slides, we'll get started. Ah. I don't know what, okay. <laughs> so uh, as uh, Shadow so helpfully pointed out, I am very lucky to have an awesome team. Toby and Aubrey are literal lifesavers. Um, and one day soon, I hope you guys will get to meet us in person and see how awesome Toby and Aubrey are. But before I start talking about TM, I want to give you some uh, a little bit of trivia here. So our two TMs are housed in Engineering Building 1 and MRC, the Monteith Research Center. And if you guys look closely, and this is not a well-known fact, and it may not be true at all, but we'll see, um, there are little lightning collectors or lightning rods on the, the, the roofs of those two buildings. And those lightning rods are not just to protect the buildings. They're actually our electron collection system. We take those cruelty-free, organic, free-range electrons from the sky, and we funnel them straight to our next slide. This is going <laughs> to, this joke doesn't work very well when someone else is controlling your slides. But it, no, 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 skip that one, Anna. No, 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 that's the wrong one. Next one. Get out. Get out. Hey, Chris, you have yeah. you still have a pop-up that is asking you to control the screen. Do you see it? There you go. Uh, you control your okay. Own 
I did not. It disappeared. And actually, I cannot click on anything, Anna. So okay. I, I think everyone's having a similar problem. So I'll go ahead and advance for you. So you guys can see a joke falling flat in real time. Quite, quite fun. So anyways, no, we don't take those electrons and go to and go to uh, create our monsters. That's that's Toby and I. We have a side project. Now, we take those electrons, the grade A electrons, and we funnel them to our two TEMs. And we have two what I call kind of Ferrari TEMs. Uh, so they're, they're extremely high performance microscopes. We have one that's the Titan, which is our microscope that has the highest spatial resolution of any TEMs that we have. And in terms of spatial resolution, what we're talking about is not you know nanometers or not even sub nanometer. We are below an angstrom. We are down into the tens of picometers. In this case, technically 70 picometers of resolution, meaning we can resolve things that are about 70 picometers or 80 picometers apart. So that that is, it, it's, it's difficult to explain how far we've come in the field of TEM in just the last 15, 20 years. So now the Titan is, is, is decked out with a variety of things that help us, you know, kind of realize Richard Feynman's dream of you know, in 1957, he gave his plenty of room at the bottom famous speech. And, you know, he, physicists like to wave their hands a little bit and make things sound fairly trivial. No offense to any physicist in the audience. Um, but he was like, look, it's pretty simple. If you want to understand the macroscopic properties of a material, you know, why is certain metals more ductile than others? Or why are certain glasses transparent, certain ceramics transparent? All these different mechanical and physical properties of a material. He said, look, it's simple. You know, just look at the atoms where they are, what atoms you have, and how they're bonded together. And the Titan is our machine, our instrument, that allows us to get closest to realizing that dream. We can do atomic structure, atomic chemistry, atomic bonding with the various attachments we have. We also have a Talos, and that's no slouch either. That's a very high-performance microscope. We're, we're not in the you know, sub-angstrom regime here. We're in the single to you know, two-angstrom or 0.2 nanometer resolution limits. So. Um, and the Talos we've kind of transformed into our in situ platform and the in situ means that we're doing experiments and we're, we're applying some sort of stimu st external stimuli and watching the sample change in real time. Um, and we can do things like look at apply heat, apply cooling, uh, put the sample in liquids, put the sample in gases, and then various combinations of those. And we have access to other holders where we can compress or stretch our sample and do various other experiments while using the extremely high spatial resolution. And in terms of, you know, an example of extremely high spatial resolution, there's an image right in the middle here um, of aluminum gallium nitride. And you can see the gallium, you can see the aluminum and the nitrogen atoms. And this was taken on the Titan. So, uh, Anna, if you don't mind going to the next slide, I'm sorry to put you to work here. So I have a little cheat sheet and, you know, not many pictures here, but why do you care about TM or why should you care about TM? So to start with a TM, it operates just like a, a transmitted light microscope. Uh, very similar operational principles, image formation principles. Obviously a big difference when we switch to our electrons, uh, our grade A electrons, don't forget. The grade B ones go to the SEM guys, no offense. Uh, <laughs> so why, why, why would we care about a TM? The good resolution, as I mentioned, we're, we're down to picometers, tens of picometers. So we're able to resolve things at, ex, you know, atomic structure. For the material scientists, we're, we're able to resolve things at that fundamental link scale of materials building, the building blocks of all materials, and then we can go upwards from there. And a lot of the techniques you've seen so far, they, they talk about, you know, we're very surface sensitive or we're looking at surfaces or slight subsurface information. TM is a, since it's transmission, we're looking at the entire volume of our sample. So we can actually see things inside our sample. And, uh, you know, as a material scientist, one very famous important example of that are things like defects, you know, dislocations and, and stacking faults and planar defects, things that exist inside, not necessarily at the surface, we're able to visualize and interpret those using TM. And then we have various uh, chemical mapping tools uh, using X-rays or electron energy loss spectroscopy or EELS. We can look at the chemistry at the atomic length scale and not just the chemistry, but again, I, I mentioned that we can start to look at changes in the bonding state or valence state of different atoms. So we can, re we can really start to understand our material. Um, if you guys have paid attention to some of the news in the field of structural biology, You'll know that cryo-TM has kind of launched a, a renaissance in the field of structural biology. So we have cryo-TM capabilities. We're, we're not at 
facility like Duke, but you know, we can do some of the, 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 the lower resolution uh, cryo TM work where we can start to look at structure of, you know, things like proteins and polymers. Um, I mentioned that we have some in situ capabilities and, and that's really important. We can, you know, not just take static images. Um, in terms of samples, we can look at pretty much any material. Uh, the, the limits will become clear shortly, but almost every type of material has been put in a TM before. So that's, that's a summary of why you might care about TM. So what's the cost there? And Anna, if you don't mind clicking. So there's, there's some bad things. There's no free lunch, as, as many of my professors always used to say. So, um, so I mentioned that we're sensitive to volumes. Uh, technically, when we take an image in the TM, just like in a transmitted light microscope, you, you are transmitting through a three-dimensional volume, but your image is two dimension, a two-dimensional image. So we're, we're projecting a volume onto a two-dimensional surface, which means that there's some artifacts of how things stack in three-dimensional space, that may not be readily apparent and may cause you to publish papers that you later retract, which was in the early days of TM, a very common occurrence, to be honest. So, um, but now we have ways of reconstructing three dimensions. Uh, Anton, in fact, one of our scientists, Anton, will talk to you about that using x-rays and computer tomography techniques. Um, there's other ways of, you know, looking at common artifacts and trying to minimize your, you know, those showing up in your image. Um, the, the TEMs use electron beams accelerated to about 10 times what an SEM usually operates at. So there's some, there's the potential of, you know, basically disintegrating your sample in fractions of a second, which does happen. Um, and then there's more subtle changes to your sample that may happen. So you always have to be careful with how you expose your sample to the electron beam inside the TEM and, and make sure you're not changing it. Um, so one of the really bad things about TM is how do you get your sample thin enough? So I, I mentioned that, you know, it's like a transmitted light microscope, except we're using electrons. And electrons interact incredibly strongly with matter. So to be transparent to an electron, your sample has to be, depending on its chemistry and its structure, anywhere from nanometers thick to, you know, maybe a few hundred nanometers. That's pretty thin. So, you know, if you're talking about a bulk steel ingot that's, you know, a meter long and you know, half a meter in diameter, and you have to get that down to a 50 nanometers thick, that's, it's, a, it's not a trivial process. So, and you have to be able to make your sample while minimizing any damage or artifacts that you may induce during the sample preparation. So, um, so there's the good, the bad, and of course we have the ugly. Uh, Anna, if you don't mind. Yeah, the ugly, and I'm sorry for using a meme in a professional presentation, but I really, this sums it up for me. So, you know, the classic meme, you have the, the young woman thinking about, oh, thinking about how wonderful TM is and all the beautiful things I can do with my sample. And then the reality of, you know, when you're actually preparing your sample, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and, and luck, and phases of the moon, and voodoo involved in trying to get a good sample. So, uh, Anna, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So... Aubrey Penn, one of the staff members here, she put together, I mean, the, these posters, and I consider these works of art via science. So these are images, various images and data sets we've collected on the Talos. And you can see we have samples from nanoparticles and, and ceramics and metals and, and thin films and some really beautiful ones performed by Aaron Bell, who you'll hear from very shortly on some various uh, biological samples, cellular samples, and they're just just absolutely gorgeous. So um, Anna, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So this is all done on the Talos. This is done on the Titan. And these are images where you can see, you know, the dots or what look like little periods. Those are atoms or technically atom columns. Um, so these are images taken on our incredibly high resolution Titan. And you can see various atomic structures and diffraction patterns and convergent beam electron diffraction patterns collected on that system. Um, just a wealth of information we can get from that. And in fact, I'm going to hand this over to Toby, Toby Tong, who can tell you a little bit more, um, hopefully about himself too, because Toby's kind of one of our OGs here. So, Hi, everybody. Um, again, like Chris said, my name is Toby Tong. Um, I actually graduated from NC State, and I've been with AIF since 2009. Um, behind me, you can actually see the Thermo Fisher Titan. It is, uh, as Chris stated, an aberration corrected scanning transmission electron microscope. The big mouthful here. 
So what's really awesome about this tool is it has an aberration corrector on it, um, which is this piece right there. This is live, so I'm right there in, 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 the, in the room. Um, but anyways, um, this corrector allows us to obtain higher resolution imaging, like the tens of picometers resolution that uh, Chris was alluding to, um, by taking into account the small defects in the lens systems that may be present or may or may not be present or so. Um, so other institutions may have a Titan, but not all of them have the aberration corrector uh, piece. Um, this tool is also um, capable of doing a lot of the in-situ experiments um, because it is a Thermo Fisher product. Um, but mo again, most of the uh, in-situ experiments are done um, on, the, on the Talos. Um, this instrument is also real, um, really neat. It's equipped with the SuperX EDS detector. So we have four detectors that are used to obtain the chemical um, uh, information of your sample. So that is found um, slightly below the aberration corrector, right around there or so. Um, this instrument also has uh, is capable of eels imaging with a Gatan spectrometer. So let's go ahead and look at some examples um, on our slides. Hey, Anna, can you give me control, please? Hey, yep, you should have a pop up. Yep, there it goes. All right, so as I said before, um, it is um, capable of doing EDS. So um, we can see elementally what, uh, the, where the locations of specific elements are on the lattice. So our example on the right hand side is a super, al super alloy of nickel chrome aluminum. And we can see specifically where these atoms are. Um, the next slide, we can also obtain um, an eel spectrum uh, to figure out where um, our gallium and arsenide uh, atoms are. And then finally, we have in situ holders. So we can obtain um, what uh, we can see what our ex uh, experiment looks like um, under a liquid of some sort, a gas of some sort. Or, a, uh, or what happens when you heat it up. Um, right now, we're looking up in the middle uh, video. And again, it is the gas cell experiment. So we can actually see a hydrogen bubble formation on aluminum nanoparticles. And on the right-hand side, we can also see a formation of particles with two different materials. Um, as you increase the temperature of, uh, of the material. And this is all due to um, holders and in situ holders that are provided by protochips and Gatan. All right, so uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Aaron Bell. He is our bio EM staff scientist. Um, Aaron has a variety of degrees in different majors. He has bachelor degrees in zoology, master's degrees in biology and PhD from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Before he joined AIF, he was the postdoc at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and he was the head of EM at New York Blood Center. And he, become, uh, he became the senior scientist at St. Mount Sinai. And he also was the manager of the Neuropathology Brain Bank and Research Core. Aaron joined us last year, and then, uh, so here it is. Uh, Aaron, please take it away. Thanks, Shadow. Um, I'm very happy to be here to present our bio-EM capabilities. Uh, Shadow had mentioned, uh, I've been here just a little over a year. Both Chris Winkler and I have been here almost at the same time. He started a little sooner than I did, but uh, it's been a great pleasure to work here. We, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the cryo bio EM capabilities that we have, that have evolved at the AIF uh, over the past year since I started here. So I want to first, let's see, um, can I go to slides, Anna? 
Thank you. Okay. Yep. So I'm going to talk about the Leica EM ACE 900, our freeze fracture system. So we got this just before I arrived at the NCSU. Um, obviously, as the name implies, it performs freeze fracture. It's also freeze etching and e-beam coating. Can perform both double replica as well as single replica fracturing. It's good for biological and polymer, polymer sample preparation. It can perform up to five runs a day, maybe six, you're really into it, and produce upwards of 20 replicas, which is a lot more than you can actually scan in one day. So, so then I want to just kind of talk about the workflow for the freeze fracture. Up in the left hand corner, this is for double replica fracturing. So we have these little copper gold hats, and there's two of them that you put your sample on top of one, place another one on top of it, and you make this little sandwich, a sample sandwich. You then take that sandwich and you insert it into your sample holder, so these little slots here. And then you close these little gates over it so they don't fly out of the machine when you rotate it during freeze fracturing. And all of this, of course, has to be done under liquid nitrogen. So after you plunge freeze your sample, you, you take them out, place them into your holder under liquid nitrogen, and then quickly insert the specimen rod and then insert that specimen into the sample chamber. So this is the actual the stage uh, where the sample slides onto and it's set to about 180 minus 183 degrees Celsius. Uh, then you have to wait for it to equil equilibrate for a little while. And when you're ready, you actually fracture the specimen by taking, there's a knife, you can't see it in this image, but there's a knife up here in the stage and you hit this little lever on the stage and it cracks open your samples. So you have two mirror images from each of two samples here and here. You then remove your specimen and then you take and float the resulting platinum carbon replica onto the surface of water. So you can see here in this bottom image, these little copper hats, there are single hats. Those are resting at the bottom of the uh, well of the water. And you see these little gray films. It's best seen in this last one here, but there's four little circles. And that's your, those are your platinum carbon replicas. You then take those and gently remove them and place them onto the surface of chromic acid so you could clean them overnight to get rid of all the biological goop. So once all that stuff's dissolved, then you do lots of washes, you collect them on a PEM grid, and then you can let them dry and observe them in the transmission electron microscope. Uh, that's my arrow. So there's an example here. We've, as I mentioned, we've done a lot of different samples. Uh, in fact, there's only six of these instruments in the US. And uh, according to the engi service engineer, ours is getting used much more frequently than any of the others. So we use it on average of once a week, primarily to uh, Dr. Candace Hagler's lab. So she's actually looking at plant cells and the proteins uh, that are in the membranes of these plant cells, primarily moss. Uh, interestingly enough, we use yeast as kind of a paste to kind of, I don't know, not necessarily cement the um, samples together, but to kind of, so we can get a continuous replica once we do the shadowing. So, but I have some images of yeast here. So there's about six cells that you can see. There's four that have been basically fractured right in half. So you can see there's a vacuole here. This is actually a nuclear complex. And these two cells here have actually had the cell wall removed. So you can see the plasma membrane surface. So you have the yeast cell here, like my hand, you have a cell wall, then you fracture it, then you have the plasma membrane. So that all those little lines are the surface of the plasma membrane, which is pretty cool. You look at a higher magnification of yeast, you can see this structure in the middle is actually the nucleus. You look a little closer, 
And you can see these are all nuclear pore complexes, which is pretty cool. Uh, they're pretty large and very uh, easily seen in yeast. Uh, probably Xenopus is the largest nuclear pore complexes that are seen in biological samples, but these come pretty close. So the next instrument that we uh, I want to talk about is the Leica EM ice, which is our high pressure freezer. We just received this uh, a few months ago and just had it installed last month. So we haven't even really taken it out for a spin yet, but we will shortly. The um, how does HPF work? So it works by lowering the freezing point of cell water by about 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, this thereby reduces the rate of ice crystal nucleation and growth so that you can limit any uh, ice crystal damage in your sample. So as a result, the tissue is fixed in a near native state. The, some of the caveats to this technique is that it's only, you can only really look at about 200 microns uh, into the surface of your sample. All, that's about the best freezing in the sample itself is around 200 microns. Sometimes you can get a little better, you can get a little deeper, or sometimes a little worse, but around 200 microns is a rule of thumb. Uh, we also have the uh, AFS2, the free substitution system that, that goes along with that. And in fact, you can see both of those instruments behind me on my right shoulder. So it's the HPF and over in the corner here is the free substitution unit. So it has an automatic reagent handling system, which is that little rectangular box on the top. And it also has a LED UV lamp to polymerize resins at low temperatures. So once you take your sample out of the HPF, you transfer it to your free substitution system. And then over the course of a day or two, you substitute in all the chemicals, uh, osmium, urinal acetate, uh, whatever other reagents you want, and including resin. And uh, then it'll polymerize into a block. And you take that block and then you um, perform ultramicrotomy on it. And so here's uh, just, just one example of how HPF can make your life a little better and get some beautiful results. So this is a neuromuscular junction in Drosophila larvae. So if you look on the left, this is these are two comparative examples. HPF is on the left and conven conventional um, chemical fixation is on the right. As you can see, there are a lot of uh, spaces and uh, extracted uh, nuclear cytoplasm, nucleoplasm in the uh, conventionally fixed sample. Also a lot of spaces here and you get pretty much a continuous um, sample uh, of a continuous beautiful picture, <laughs> for lack of better words, uh, that you can see in the left hand side. HPF is what if it works well, you get you can't get any better images. Um, let's see the next one. So I'm going to talk a little bit. We have some additional equipment for cryo EM. The like the UC7, it also has a cryo attachment. So we can do pro, we can cut frozen sections on it. We also have a cryo SEM Joel 7600F, which that is also outfitted with its own little freeze fracture system over here on the left. It's a little, it's small in this picture, but it has its own mini freeze fracture system. It consists of a scalpel blade on a stick and you just whack the sample and then you can coat it with your platinum carbon and then directly put it into the SEM so you can look at your, cold, your frozen sample. Uh, then we have, of course, Chris had talked about the thermal Fisher Talos. It also has some cryo capability with its as a cold stage, a Gatan cold stage that you can look at frozen samples. And my last slide is, uh, we, this is a cell that was imaged with the cryo SEM. So you can see on the left, you can see the surface of a cell. And then on the right, the, that cell has been fractured so you can see the inside. This one has some crystal damage, some ice crystal damage, but you can, it's still kind of cool. You can sort of see some of the, probably right here, some of the um, components, cell components inside the cell. With high pressure freezing, it would look a little better without all the holes. 
So uh, we can certainly try that in, with our new high pressure freezer and see what we get. Thank you, Aaron. So next, I'm going to introduce Anton. He is our uh, X-ray nano CT postdoc researchers. Anton has a master's degree in engineering physics and PhD in mechanical engineering in Sweden. So Anton, here it is. Please show us your awesome X-ray nano CT. Thank you so much, Shadow, and welcome everyone to the X-ray computer tomography laboratory. Uh, in here, we actually look at what's inside of your sample because we all know that it's the inside that counts, right? So I'm standing in front of the flagship equipment that we have here. It's the Extradia 510 Versa. Uh, so we are basically using X-rays to shine through your sample and to see what, what it looks like on the inside. I was planning to give you a tour actually of the instrument. So let's open this piece up. And let's move you so you can see something. Ah, okay. So inside this cabinet made out of lead and steel to keep the radiation inside, we have a couple of important components. On the left side here, we have an X-ray tube. When we turn it off, it becomes hot. And as a side effect, it also produces X-rays. Uh, what we actually do is that we accelerate electrons. Of course, the free range one that uh, uh, Chris talked about, we accelerate them into a very thin tungsten film at the front of the X-ray tube where they interact and produce, as I said, a lot of heat, but also X-rays. We get characteristic X-rays and we get a polychromatic spectra from the branch strato. And that is really what this system relies on. This tube can go from 30 to 160 kilo electron volts for acceleration, and that gets translated into the energy that the photons have. And basically the higher energy that you have in your photons, the more material can they travel through. So with this equipment, we can travel through a fair amount of metal. So if you have a steel sample, maybe we can go through maybe like five to 10 millimeters of that before it starts to become a big problem. Anyway, from this X-ray tube, we produce this cone of X-rays and they travel through our sample. And the sample is positioned here on our sample stage. Uh, right now, there's a piece of foam <laughs> standing here. The sample stage can rotate around this axis and that's basically all it does. Finally, the X-rays end up here at our detector array. And in this machine, we have two detectors. We have a CCD camera hidden over here with very small pixels. It's very good for high resolution scanning. And then we also have a CMOS flat panel hidden in there, which is good for scanning larger things. A nice thing about the extra Versa is that we also have this objective array. So actually when the X-rays hit this part of the instrument, there is a scintillator material here that converts the X-rays into visible light that we can then run through these magnifying objectives. And that allows this instrument to actually get spatial resolutions of around a micron for small samples. So if you are looking to get these types of resolution, you should have a sample in this size, size range. So that's a small sample glued to the top of a dress man pin. They need to be small if you want high resolution. On the other hand, we can also scan larger things. So for example, if we take this one out, we can put in a larger sample table and place this box over, over there. So this one was left here in the room and I'm not really sure what's in there. It sounds dangerous. So I don't want to stick my fingers in. Let's put it here and try to do a live test. That's always fun. So let's close the doors back up. Let's move ourselves to the instrument computer. So I think you can see what's on the screen. So this is actually our box in there. So the source is now on the left side and the detected rays on the right side. And right now I'm actually moving the flat panel in instead of the objectives because this box is quite big. So we can move on and we can actually Let's turn down the exposure. Turn on the x-rays and see what's inside the box. Let's see. 
Aha. So I hope you can see at least a little bit of what's on this screen. This is actually a 2D radiograph of this box or its contents, actually. So you can make this out here. Of course, it's difficult to make 2D radiographs out in a good way, but it seems like there are razor blades in here and needles and screws and stuff. So it was a good thing I didn't stick my fingers in there. So what we actually do now is that we take a ton of these 2D images, usually in the thousands, and we stitch them together into a 3D volume. Between each of these images, we rotate the sample a very, very, very small amount until we have rotated it like an entire revolution. You can also rotate 180 degrees plus the cone angle, but you usually get better results if you do a full rotation. And this can take a long time. Uh, typically, it can take up to 10 hours to make a complete scan, but it's well worth it. Let's move to the slide deck and see some examples of what type of information we actually get out in the system. Okay. Hi. Let's see if I can control this one. I can, maybe. Okay, so we actually have two systems. The one I showed you is the one on the right, the X-Radia microscope. But we also have a smaller one, a desktop version called the Bruker Sky Scanner. I would say that is a good entry level system. If you are looking to learn how to do computer tomography, it's a good system to start out with. It's fairly difficult to break, and you can still get a good idea of how the technique works, and then move on to the to the larger system. Uh, so here are some examples of what we actually can look at in the system. And it, as I said before, it's, it's a very versatile system. We can look at almost anything. The, the limitations are basically if we can get through your sample. So if you have a very big part that is highly attenuating to x-rays, like a metal, for example, you might need to reduce its size. Uh, and also a critical point is that your sample has to be fixed during this rotation. If your sample moves while we are rotating it, the entire scan will be useless, basically. We will not be able to reconstruct the 3D volume from it. So the sample needs to be able to be fixed, and it cannot be too thick if it's highly attenuating. So here are some examples. So we, yeah, we can scan basically anything. A, a, just ask us, and we, we can discuss your project. And here are some examples then. These are 3D renderings from some scans that we have made. So you can see an acorn, and you can see a battery and its inside, and you can see the tooth of a, of, a, of a dog and some measurements. But really, to really appreciate the power of computer tomography, you need to see the 3D volume in motion. So hopefully, I can start a movie showing that. Ooh, it starts. Excellent. So this is an example of a geology uh, sample that we ran. So it's basically a piece of sand or a, a group, <laughs> a bunch of sand actually. And it's fitted into that small tube that you can see rotating in the center of the screen now. So on the left, X-ray uh, tube, on the right, the X-ray array. These are the two the images that we collect from the sand grains. And you can see them rotating around. And already here, we can see that there's lots of interesting stuff going on and now we take them and we use a lot of magic and we create this so this is a 3d volume of your actual sample and of course the cool thing here is that this is not only the surface we can actually cut into your sample and look at what it looks like on the inside so we can get information about the morphology or we can get information about the relative densities and we can do a ton of measurements so here, for example, we have isolated all of the different particles, and we can measure them with regards to, for example, their volume and the volume, the volume distribution. We can look at the surface area of the samples, and we can look at the aspect ratio of the, uh, of the particles, which is usually very interesting. And we can, of course, measure them for the, the, their diameters, and actually the, the truest, largest and smallest diameter. It's very difficult to do otherwise. We can also characterize the, the pore space of your sample, which is usually very interesting. Just to check porosity in, in this system can be very rewarding for many different sample types. We can also check connectivity between the pores. We can, of 
course, see how large they are, where they are, and so on. And we can also use this type of information to extract a mesh and run simulations. For example, here we are doing a fluid simulation on, on the sand grain pack, where you can look at the flow through it. So for geology, this is typically very interesting to, to see how, how uh, fluids flow through, through the ground, for example. And here, finally, we are traveling through uh, the, uh, the sample to look at the actual data that comes out of the machine. So this is basically what we will produce for you initially before an analysis, is this type of image stack, uh, basically slices of your sample. Uh, yes, and that's it. So if you have anything that you want to, to try out here, please reach out to me and we can discuss the project and get the test scan going very soon. That's it for me, I think. Thank Thanks. you, Anton. So if you like to see more uh, YouTube videos, uh, please go to our NC State AIS YouTube channel that uh, uh, Anton actually provides so many uh, awesome nano city images and uh, uh, you know how it, it, how it is done for you. So now let me introduce Chuck. Chuck is our SEM lab manager. Chuck has a bachelor's degree in physics and master's degree in material science and engineering. Before joining us at AIF, he was a product a specialist for POC Scientific Instrument Instrument, and he was SPM product manager at JEOL. Chuck right now in charge of the VPSEM and also the AFM. Chuck, please take it away. All right. So my name is Chuck Mooney. This is our Varios Ultra High Resolution SEM. Uh, before I get started, though, I would like to point out I was a student here in the 90s before Roberto started working here, which is why some people think I've been around longer than Roberto. And fun fact, Toby and I are the only two people who work at AF who are not only graduates of NC State University, but also Raleigh natives. So this is our ultra high resolution SEM. It is capable of what I am now convinced is the fundamental resolution limit for SEM, which is a half nanometer. If you want to learn more about why that is a fundamental resolution limit, I would be more than happy to tell you. That's too long a story for right now. This microscope is equipped with a load lock so that you can load a sample without having to break vacuum and go in through the front door. There's a, scan, a standard secondary electron detector, a high resolution secondary electron detector. There is an insertable backscatter detector. There are two in-column high-energy electron detectors. There's a transmission detector. There's also an X-ray detector in the back and an EBSD detector. So let's go to the slide deck. So I don't see anything that's going to, oh, it says I'm controlling the slide deck, great. <clears throat> So our other instrumentation consists of the variable pressure SEM. It's a Hitachi S3200. We call this the variable pressure SEM. It's a workhorse microscope used for low resolution applications, meaning that primarily you look at 100 nanometer or larger features. You can find smaller features than that, but it's not very satisfying with that microscope. It's much more satisfying with the ultra high resolution SEM. It's also equipped with a secondary electron detector, an insertable backscatter detector, and an X-ray detector that you can see right here. It can accommodate fairly large samples as well as performing work that requires an electrical feed through such as EBIC, which is electron beam induced current and voltage contrast, or if you want to apply a bias to a sample while you're imaging it to see what happens. The VP part means that we can operate in charge reduction mode, which allows us to image insulating samples that are not particularly clean and can be observed without contaminating the instrument or applying a conductive coating. The Varios, we just talked about, it has extremely high resolution. One of its claims to fame is that it has high resolution at low voltage. So even at 500 volts, we have one nanometer resolution, and that allows us to look at insulating samples without a coating. Although the Varios does that in a different way than the VPSEM. The VPSEM uses high energy electrons in the backscatter detector. The Varios uses low energy electrons in a secondary detector. We also have a cryo SEM. It's in, equipped with a cryo stage for in situ cryogenic experiments, as well as a cryo prep chamber so that you can prepare your samples uh, under cryogenic conditions. Cryo SEMs are typically used to observe hydrated or soft materials such as emulsions or gels or unprepared cellular samples. 
uh, samples are flash frozen in an external freezer and then excess water remo is removed in the cryo prep chamber. It also has a knife that's uh, this little, one of these little arms that's sticking up here so you can reach over and cut your sample inside the, the uh, cryo prep chamber. Then you will uh, typically increase the pressure a little bit, which allows water to sublime away from your sample. And then you coat it with an in-situ gold coater. So just, we talked about traditional microscopy and some people have mentioned scanning microscopy. The FIB is a scanning microscope. The atomic force microscope that Philip's gonna talk about is a scanning microscope. The scanning microscope is a scanning microscope. A traditional microscope is going to use a set of lenses to project a virtual image of a sample onto some sort of a detector, which in this case is being shown as an eyeball, although it's typically a camera now. And the important part to note here is that the entire image is projected everywhere at once simultaneously so that we're projecting all of the photons everywhere through the sample and they're striking the detector and we build an image very, very quickly. With a scanning micro microscope, what we do is we place the beam at the first point on the sample and we collect data with some sort of a detector. In an SEM, we use an electron beam. In an AFM, we use a physical probe. In the FIB, we use an ion beam. So let's take the example of an SEM collecting secondary electrons. We'll place the beam at the first point. We'll collect, suck up all the secondary electrons that are emitted at that first point, and we'll assign those to the first point on the screen. And then we'll move to the second point in the line. We'll collect all the secondary electrons there, and we'll assign the total number to the second point on the screen. And we continue in a raster pattern until we get to the last point. In this case, I'm showing a raster pattern as a digital raster pattern where you scan over, scan back, take a step, and then repeat until you get to the last scan line. If there's a difference in electrons between that are emitted between the first point and the second point, that gives us contrast. Without contrast, there is no resolution. Here are some examples from the S3200 variable pressure microscope. This is some pine pollen. That's that uh, sort of awful yellowish green pollen that comes here in March. And I literally took a sample stub down to my car and touched it to the car and then put a little gold coating on it. And here's a picture of uh, what that pine pollen looks like. This is a copper foam. This illustrates why SEMs were originally developed to begin with in the 40s. And that is because of the depth of field. You can see things in focus deep into the sample. Here's a manganese phosphate coating on steel that you, allows you to see the uh, very beautiful crystalline structure of the manganese phosphate. And this is a gold palladium, palladium columnar structure. And this is actually some uh, crud that I scraped off of an old gold coater. Here is an ultra high resolution SEM picture. It's a million times magnification. This is collected with our microscope and it shows gold particles on carbon and we can see a 0.6 nanometer spacing between the particles. Please be careful when you look at images like this and don't report a 661.5 picometer spacing because I don't believe that for a minute. I'd call it a six and a half uh, 0.6 five nanometer spacing, probably 0.6 would be even better, maybe 0.7. The uh, software people tend to uh, give you way too many significant figures that are not very significant. The Varios is equipped with a Schottky emitter. It's a very stable emitter. It doesn't give you the best potential resolution, but it does allow you to achieve what I am convinced is the fundamental limit. Our next image is another million X image. This is of a uh, tin on carbon sample. And these are single crystal pieces of tin, although they don't look all that single crystal like. And that's because an oxide has grown on the surface of them. And you will notice that there is a 40 nanometer marker right there. So we're literally looking at things that are sub nanometer on the surface. Here's another image. This is from uh, Tom Labine's group in material science and engineering. And this is one of the claims to fame of this microscope. This is an uncoated image of an insulating sample. This is a latex sphere that's got DNA and the DNA is the uh, sort of lighter contrast. And then the bright spots are tethered gold nanorods. And so this is the sort of thing that you cannot do without putting a gold coating on top of it in a standard SEM. And if you put a gold coating on top of it, you're gonna lose a lot of the contrast with your gold nanorods. A lot of people liken this to an image of the earth, especially taken after dark. We have a transmission detector. This is a couple of examples of, this is in a thin section of uh, bacteria that was imaged with a transmission detector in both bright field mode and high angle, high angle annular dark field mode. 
these were collected simultaneously. We can collect from multiple segments of the transmission detector at one time and collect, actually, it's possible to collect more input channels than the microscope has available. One of the things that we can do with the SEM is elemental analysis, and that's because X-rays are produced by high energy electrons interacting with the sample. So a high energy electron from the beam will come screaming into the sample and it'll kick out an inner shell electron. That inner shell electron goes away. It's called a secondary electron. The images that I've shown so far have been secondary electron images, except for the transmission images. The primary electron keeps on going. And so now we have an atom that has a hole in electron space. So it is ionized and atoms do not like that very much. They want for the electrons like to fill inner shell spaces. So an outer shell high energy electron will, will want to transition into this inner shell hole in electron space. And as we all should have learned in freshman physics class, all of the electrons and all the shells and subshells of the atoms have to have very, very specific energies. So to transition from one shell to another, it has to give up energy. And one of the mechanisms through which it can give up energy is by releasing an X-ray photon that has exactly the energy between those transitions. People who are much smarter than I am and far more dedicated to working all the time than I am have calculated all of the energy transitions between all of the atoms that exist so that we know we can measure those transitions and know which atoms it came from. If I know physicists the way I think I know them, then they made up some atoms and they calculated all those transition, all those electron shell energies as well. This is an EDS X-ray spectrum. We're doing energy dispersive spectroscopy where we collect all the, elect, all the X-rays at once and we sort them by energy. In this spectrum, we can see background and the background is called Bremsstrahlung. It is where electrons from the beam are being decelerated in the columbic field of the atoms of the sample. And those are real X-rays. It is not noise. We can see two copper peaks. These are the copper K peaks. We can see a series of copper L peaks. All of these came from the same copper sample be, because the electron shell structure is complex enough that multiple interactions can occur. And this particular sample has been sitting out in air and copper will oxidize in air. And if you look very, very closely, you will notice that there is a little bit of aluminum and a little bit of silicon, and there is a little bit of sulfur and a little bit of phosphorus in very, very small amounts, so small that the microscope didn't pick them up. Uh, although I'm very sensitive to that sort of thing and I notice very small trace amounts of things and that probably means that somebody touched my sample with their fingers. We can map the x-rays. Here is an image from the microscope. This is a secondary electron image and here are maps showing where the tin is located and where the carbon is located. One of the problems that the, we have with the ultra high resolution microscope is that the X-ray detector has a relatively shallow angle. And because it has a relatively shallow angle, if you have tall features, like these are actually spheres that are sticking up above the sample, you can see some shadowing. There's not quite as much shadowing from the tin because the tin's a high energy X-ray. The carbon does, these X-rays just don't have enough energy to go through the tin sphere to get to the detector, which is away and opposite from the uh, shadows. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. So let me introduce Philip. He is the RTN project scientist. Uh, Philip has a bachelor's degree uh, in textile technology and master's degree in textile, both at NC State. And Philip it was a research assistant at the Nanwuven Institute before joining RTN. At AIF, Philip is responsible for service, maintenance, and training for the nano indentation lab, which is behind him and Kian's laser profilometer. He also assists with the SEM, AFM service and training. Philip, please take away. All right, uh, hi everybody. So I'm reporting to you from the nano dinner closet. I mean lab, it's a very small space in here. So I can't give you a nice big wide angle Stanley Kubrick shot of the instrument, uh, but this is it behind me. This is the Bruker TI-988 Tribal and Denner. And it may not look like much, but it's our only physical testing uh, instrument. So if you've been paying attention uh, for the past two hours, you realize we're not a physical testing facility. We are mostly in microscopy with electron microscopy and spectroscopy. And uh, so this is unique from everything else you've seen today in that it's the only thing that can characterize the physical traits of a, of a sample if you come into our lab. So uh, it can, it's basically a fancy poking machine. Uh, you have these very, very small uh, diamond probes, and I'll show you more about the scale of what that's uh, working at. Uh, and we force that into a sample and then bring the probe out the whole time monitoring force and displacement. 
And from that, we can get physical properties like uh, Young's modulus, hardness, and other things. So I'm going to switch over to the slides now and actually readjust so I've got a little bit better lighting and then uh, talk to you about a few more tools in our tool. So uh, there are three uh, tools or instruments that I'm going to go over for you uh, in these last 10 minutes. And doing so in 10 minutes is quite a daunting task. So I'm going to try to keep it nice and uh, nice and uh, simple and all together and high level. So forget for a second that I just mentioned that the Nano and Dinner is our physical testing tool. I'll explain to you why I'm presenting it to you with the other two instruments that you see on this slide. So all three instruments that you see listed here, our atomic force microscope, the confocal laser scanning microscope, and our nano indenter all function as technically what we call a scanning probe microscope or SPM as Chuck just mentioned. Now, why would you use an SPM? So let's say you have a microscope in your lab or you bring a sample to Chuck and we look at it in our SEM and you see features on it. So if you looked at this perovskite sample in, in your microscope and you saw these triangles or, and shapes and everything. Well, it's great we know what size they are, but what if we want to actually know how tall they are? 3D quantification is not as easy in a standard microscope. You need something that can actually quantifiably collect three-dimensional data, and that's where SPM comes in. So in any type of SPM, you may have a physical probe or in the CLSM uh, uh, version, it, we actually have a laser probe, but in any case, the probe will be scanning along the surface and then this is an example of an AFM tip where you have a tip hanging off of a cantilever scanning along the surface and the entire time it's scanning in that raster pattern that, uh, that Chuck also just showed you on a previous slide, it's collecting 3D information for every pixel and every point that you uh, specify. And then it can reproduce a 3D data set of the area that it scanned and then uh, also generate a 2D image based on 3D information. So, not just having a two-dimensional image, but also having a 3D data set that we can then go and profile and say, okay, this feature is this tall, and then this feature is actually a groove, and it's this deep. And so all of these operate in that way. So the first of which is the atomic force microscope, which is the highest resolution of the next three that I'm about to show you. So an atomic force microscope, you have a very wide selection of tips that you can use to scan in a very small area. So you can get sub-nanometer resolution of samples and you can do areas as large as up to 90 microns squared on our, uh, on our uh, system. So as an example, this is a, an AFM image of polyethylene, which is actually just a sample pulled from a milk jug or a water jug. And we scan the tip in an area, and then we, we assign the color scale to be going from dark, meaning lowest points, to brighter, white, meaning higher points, and then filling the grayscale in between. So we can not only have a 2D image, it gives an idea of, okay, this is a valley, and then this is a peak. Um, we can also go and do uh, quantifiable profilometry to actually measure how tall they are or how deep they are, or you can do statistical analysis like roughness of that. So all of these basically create uh, what we call a topography image of your sample. And if you're not familiar with the term topography, uh, if you Google what a topographical map is, if you're not aware, uh, a topographical map of North Carolina, uh, for instance, would show you where the mountains are uh, and, and, and where the valleys are and everything. Uh, so basically, this, all these instruments generate a topographical map of your sample. Uh, now, if you don't have a lot of topographical uh, contrast on your sample or you have other uh, ways that your sample uh, spatially differentiates itself, uh, you may not be totally lost in the AFM might, it may not totally be useless to you. So for example, if you have a two-phase polyethylene where you have two distinct phases of a polymer, one that's, uh, uh, that has different viscoelastic properties than the other and they're drastically different, in the topography image, for instance, you may not get a lot of contrast and it may not be obvious where those phases are. But on the right side, we're showing what we call the phase image uh, where in, in the previous uh, animation I was showing you, this tip is staying in full contact the whole time. More often than not, we're actually tapping the tip along the surface. And when we do that, if the sample has different areas where it has different viscoelastic properties, it may hold on to the tip a little bit more as it's tapping along and 
basically how sticky your sample is in different areas will call, uh, will hold on to it more and it will give you distinct contrast in the phase image that may not be visible in the topography image. So this area and this area is the exact same area on the exact same sample. Now I want to point out that this is an ideal sample. Just because you have a sample with two different phases doesn't mean that you, uh, you're going to get the exact same result. Uh, but I would argue we're also showing you a lot of ideal samples today. So uh, make sure you uh, message us and let us know uh, some information about your samples and we'll figure out the best approach. Now you have a little bit more, uh, if you, you can also pick other tips, like if you can, if you have the right hardware and you have a conductive tip, you can also look at uh, electrical properties and magnetic force, uh, magnetic properties in an area as well. Again, if you don't have topical, topographical contrast. And then this is an actual picture, picture of the instrument. All right, so the next one is our Keyence BKX 1100, which is a confocal laser scanning microscope. This is not a Keurig coffee machine. It is a microscope. And I actually want you to think of this instrument simply as a microscope. So if you can use an optical microscope, you can use this instrument. So not only does it take an optical image like any other microscope would, it also has a scanning laser, which is going to scan in the area, keep using this word scanning, and it's going to raster and collect 3D data for that image as well. So from that example that I showed you on the first one, it not only takes a nice pretty color image of a sample, but you also get three-dimensional data of that uh, sample. So if you have, uh, and the scale that this is working on is much larger and then also lower resolution than the AFM that I just mentioned. I mentioned that the largest area you can do on an AFM, on our AFM is about 90 microns squared. And if you look at the scale bar, on an AFM, I probably wouldn't be able to do an area more than that larger than what I'm kind of gesturing with my mouse cursor right here. And a conservative estimate on the AFM that would take an hour and a half, uh, a more realistic estimate would be like three hours on that on the AFM. So we lose resolution with the Keyence, but we gain much larger areas and much more flexibility on samples because the laser is not in contact with the sample. So if you brought a fiber sample to me on uh, to look at on AFM, I, we would need some way to fix those samples because those, those fibers are going to move during measurement. So with having a laser, uh, we don't have that problem. So on this example here, we're looking at basically calendar bonding regions in non-wovens uh, where they create a hot embossing, uh, a, a hot area on the sample, which basically melts the fibers locally to create a bonding point. And then we can go and use the 3D data to profile how deep that uh, area is. And the last of which uh, is the nano indenter, which I showed you when we first started. Again, it's our only physical characterization tool, but in, in nano indentation, we're forcing a very rigid probe into a material and then removing it. And throughout the whole time, we can monitor load and indenter displacement. And from that forced displacement curve, we can get uh, properties like Young's modulus and hardness if we know the geometry of the tip and the physical properties of the tip, which is usually diamond. Um, so this is an example uh, of, a, of an indentation into bovine dentin. Uh, and you'll notice I have a 3D image of the indent as well. So the same tip that you can use to indent the sample, we can again scan the surface collecting 3D data. Now this is somewhere between resolution, uh, sitting between AFM and the Kent. So the nano indenter is probably in the middle in terms of resolution. Uh, and, but the reason we need an SPM function on the nano indenter is because we're working at very, very small scale. So where the nano indenter comes into play is that you may not have a lot of volume of samples. So if you have a thin film, you can't go do uh, that's 100 nanometers thick on a substrate. You can't just go and do micro indentation because that's going to blow through the whole film and you're gonna, not going to get all of the, uh, you destroy the substrate that's on it too but we get to work at much lower loads and much lower volume so we can isolate the outermost surface of, of whatever the sample you're looking at. Now there's a, a lot of caveats to that, like we need low roughness uh, and there's a lot that goes into this and I would really recommend you go look at our uh, YouTube channel where I've uploaded an almost, uh, I think a little over 30 minute uh, description of this technique. But one of the interesting things about our newer system is that uh, we also have two dimensional testing. So the regular nano notation is usually a one dimensional test, but on uh, the new triboendenter, they call it a triboendenter because it can do more tribology. Uh, the, so we can also do two-dimensional testing like scratch testing and uh, nanoware testing where we basically force the probe in and then uh, use the same imaging function to kind of wear material down and you can measure how much material was worn. 
if you can induce fracture, you can uh, measure fracture length off of the, uh, the indenter uh, shape. And you can get an approximation of fracture toughness. It's not exact, uh, but it is a good option if you, uh, if you are looking for that and just need an estimation. And so with that, uh, I actually have a few questions before, and you can actually stop sharing the slides now, and I will look at the Q&A. So, Thank you, Philip. Uh, if I have time, I'll answer these questions. So we got a question earlier about how can I measure the thickness of my samples? The liquid samples are dried on the microscope glass slide, so we'll be measuring the dried film on the glass slide. So what you're basically doing is what I think of as drop casting. And either, either the AFM or the Keyence may be able to work on that type of sample, but it depends on uh, how thick you estimate that film to be. Uh, if it's micron scale and you're putting it on, drop casting it on a glass slide, we can potentially score it with a razor blade and then measure, kind of measure that like a step height with the laser. But if it's much smaller, uh, if it's at the nano scale, AFM would probably be better. But uh, I would uh, recommend you reach out to, to myself or Chuck and we can, based on what actual film you're depositing, we can uh, consider different substrates even. It may not need to be a glass slide. Uh, and then one more question, how does the conductive attachment work with AFM? Basically, you need a tip that is conductive and you need uh, hardware uh, that can actually measure that current or amplify it and, and measure it as well. Uh, maybe Chuck will chime in and say a little bit more, but basically you need the right hardware, the right tip, and uh, um, you will basically you can also apply bias using a probe station and, and uh, measure electric fields on your sample. There's a whole can of worms on this, and I don't want to keep us on this too long, but Naman, please reach out to myself and Chuck with some more, or and the other person that answered the uh, electrical question. I think they were anonymous. Please reach out to us, and uh, we'll give you more details. Thank you. Now, uh, we are going to spend the, the, the last two minutes to talk about how do you better engage with us. So, for example, if your advisor get the project and then you want, uh, he or she wants to spend money on uh, using our facility. So, Anna is going to teach us how you can better engage with us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so thank you, Shadow. Uh, as we talked about at the beginning, I um, handle our entire website and social media online platform. If it's online, I usually um, am responsible for it. And I forgot to mention that I also help our internal users. So if you're an internal NC State only user, uh, whether you're a student, postdoc, or PI, uh, if you have questions about your agreement process or anything, please feel free to let me know. Uh, I handle all of our internal agreements. So this is just our website. I wanna quickly review it. Um, our current operating status and instructions, obviously during COVID times, uh, we update this. I think the last time we updated it was in August. So it tells you how to get an agreement. It tells you um, how you can drop off your sample safely. It's very helpful. So I definitely recommend going there if you have any questions about the process now. Um, our upcoming events, I also want to highlight this. We have a FIB short course coming up October 15th. I highly recommend short courses uh, for AIF. Right now we're offering them for free. Normally we charge $50. Uh, and industry users, we usually charge $350. So uh, I, I'm not sure, it says limited to four participants, but I'm sure it's more because it's virtual. So um, Roberto, I don't know if you wanna chime in, but it's either going to be unlimited or, or more than four, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's definitely more. Awesome, okay, so if you want to sign up, you can do so in Mendix and there's an actual uh, link you can click to watch a video on how to do that. Um, and if you have questions about that, email me. And if you have questions about the actual short course, you can email uh, Roberto and he'll be happy to help you. Our recent news is another section I want to highlight um, and definitely recommend reading. Uh, it gives you information about our spotlight that uh, I helped to create, like Shada mentioned, and any AIF research awards, things like that. I do want to mention that we are calling for best papers. So we each year at the Carolina Science Symposium, which is still happening in November this year, uh, announce a, a best paper award for two individuals. Um, so this is for a student or postdoc only. I highly recommend you take a look. Um, we go through all of the submissions and we come together as uh, AIF staff and, and select the best one. Um, and Maude can drop that link for you in the chat if you'd like to um, check it out or know someone who's interested. 
Another section I'd like to uh, point to is the publications. If you do use the AIF, we, uh, we ask that you acknowledge us uh, and specifically uh, this award number listed right here. The digital newsletters, if you ever want to look at the previous newsletters that we have, you can do that here. Uh, this is our current issue and this is where you can subscribe. It's not newsletter overload. I promise we just send out one once a month. Um, so it's, it's really useful information and things that you may have missed event-wise or news-wise, that sort of thing. So I recommend doing that. And then one of the last things I wanna show you is our actual, um, I won't have time to show you Mendix, but if you hover over user, user portal, you can schedule an instrument and that'll take you directly to Mendix or you can click on Mendix help. Uh, I have a lot of people have questions about Mendix, which I definitely understand because you've never used it before. So we created a couple of videos for users and PIs and users, this includes external as well, not just internal. Uh, although your process is a little different and you can review your process for how to become a user here. Uh, but if you just click on each of these agreements, they're very short videos, uh, maybe 20, 30 seconds long, and it shows you click by click what you can do in Mendix to get an agreement set up with us, sign up for a short course and things like that. So very useful stuff. Um, and if anyone has any questions about any of that, please feel free to let me know. Uh, if you want to see more content on YouTube of something, um, also let me know. We'll, we'll work on doing that. Um, okay, well, Shadow, do you, you want to go ahead and wrap it up? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for uh, joining us for this, uh, our first virtual open house. Uh, I consider it is a success. Thank you so much. And then hopefully that we can see you in the lab. Bye.